topics, a little bit less drivers on decision making. I'm going to move through this reasonably quickly. It's the final morning. Um, I'm going to talk a little about the prevalence of this, talk very quickly about best screening methodology, and then go through some uh, specific substances and how they might challenge you in the clinical environment. These, um, this is the sense, by the way, the best source for this is a federal source um, from, uh, a source from the federal government, that is, that provides uh, a very effective survey screening methodology every three years I think they publish this and essentially the question goes out to a broad group of society that asks you have you used all, all of the following drugs whatever in the last month that's the basis for a lot of this but um, a decent amount of pregnant women end up using um, licit and illicit substances that may affect um, our practice. Most of the use of illicit substances uh, is marijuana. Of course, that's a changing demographic in the United States with increasing legalization. That being said, uh, most of probably what drives um, our tougher decisions really fall into this other category of use of opioids, etc. Um, and these trends, by the way, haven't changed substantially over a decade. The use of these drugs are pretty flat for the most part. Um, how does it affect obstetric management, not necessarily obstetric anesthesia management? That um, has some pretty profound impact. Um, broadly talking about the category of substance abuse, you see increased relative risk ratios of these driving obstetric outcomes. By the way, the top and the bottom one of those are substantial, uh, uh, substantially impact resource utilization for anesthesia teams covering obstetrics. Um, how do, what's the best way to screen for it? There probably is no best way. In fact, it has a lot to do with what, what your practice um, environment is to some degree. There are some practices out there that universally um, urine screen all of their patients, and that actually ends up being a, um, a reasonable thing to do given where they're practicing. But most best practice probably combines um, your judgment, the intermittent lab screening, um, with a thoughtful way of directly questioning patients. By the way, if you ask someone just directly very, probably how most of us do, um, have you used any of the following agents? Actually, in our practice, it's mostly the nurses asking the question that the denial rate is extraordinarily high. Um, how can you get around that? Well, there are validated instruments that just asking four questions in this order, the four P's screening methodology, increases the sensitivity of direct questioning um, at least into a range that is more valuable to us as clinicians. It takes advantage of um, perhaps the social phenomenon that we might answer a difficult question, more likely if it's framed if we start to blame our parents and our spouses first. Um, clearly there's a huge genetic component in this. Um, enabling is a big part of substance abuse, but um, you can get a much more um, valid answer to this if you drive it with at least a couple of work around the question rather than directly asking it. Um, what do you know about lab screening? I think the biggest question here for the clinician is that do you know what exactly is in your lab screen? Um, because it's different from all of our institutions. Um, in addition, if there are specific substances that you're worried about the management of the parturient with and it's not on your drug screen, then you may not be getting the information you need. All of these are essentially um, immunoassay screening tests followed by gas chromatography validation with pretty low instances of false positives. Um, I think about this a little bit more broadly in my administrative role in the hospital when I inherited a decision made by a predecessor to conduct non-for-cause pre-employment screening on all individuals in your institution. I suspect this occurs in many of your institutions. Um, as, a, as a military man, I had sacrificed my civil rights a long time ago and was drug screened and didn't think much about it. But the reality is Fourth Amendment rights are things people feel strongly about. And um, it is a weight against society's feelings that um, we're doing a very important job and we, people want us to be sober and that's not an unreasonable thing to sacrifice some degree of our civil rights over. Um, it happens to bus drivers. Why not people in our environment? That being said, uh, it's a little controversial and I don't know how you feel about it. One of the questions about lab screening is, 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 is this going to pick up substances within a time frame that's actually going to impact um, my clinical concerns? And the answer is almost certainly yes and across the board in every substance you look at. If they've used it within a time period that you're 
worried about it, its effect on your anesthetic, it's going to be picked up if you're testing for the substance as part of your screen. Um, the one exception might be alcohol in terms of its uh, systemic effects and chronic effects, even if it's not used within a time period where it's picked up. And by the way, most drug screens, obviously, you're not looking for alcohol. Um, and it may affect your uh, drug, it may affect the way you manage your patients. Um, what is the prevalence of alcohol specifically within the obstetric population? And this, these are the numbers. Um, you know, there's always jokes around the fact that how do you think most people get pregnant? You know, it's, it's binge drinking um, at the time of conception, et cetera. Um, you know, certainly very concerning public health implications of heavy use of drinking during organogenesis. Uh, that being said, it's almost surprising that we don't see more fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. By the way, a $6 billion public health impact on us and one that we haven't made substantial improvements on. What does this do for you uh, practicing anesthesia? Really, most of the issues resolve around managing acute alcohol intoxication and some of the effects of chronic alcoholism. Yes, it's possible for young women um, to develop end-stage um, liver disease um, and still become pregnant. Um, and we can talk a little about the, the issues. Th these are, I think, mostly fairly intuitive to those of us who practice anesthesia in terms of managing acute alcohol intoxication. But probably one of the more interesting points in this is the ethical considerations in obtaining consent in an intoxicated parturient regardless of substance. Well, I think as you know, um, there are challenges about whether it's appropriate to obtain informed consent or is that process compromised uh, when you're taking it from a patient who's in 10 out of 10 pain. I think the reassuring point for most of us practitioners, we usually engage in those discussions of risks and benefits in people who are in 10 out of 10 pain and not listening to us, in people who are under the influence of substances. Fortunately for us, it doesn't play a large role in terms of um, malpractice risk. It really doesn't come up to the degree that I think a lot of people think it does. Are you going to be challenged for the fact that they will say, well, of course, you got me to sign the paper when I was under the influence of, well, let's say pain. That's a less controversial one. I think it tends to be less of a consideration for most people. Um, what are the specific things about chronic alcohol abuse? They primarily relate to, number one, is the synthetic function of the liver compromised to the degree that it think it would cause coagulopathy and be a risk for neuraxial testing, and, and you'd probably have some obligation to determine that. Um, and the other ones are primarily the uh, the prevalence of peripheral neuropathy in patients with chronic alcohol disease and whether that would confound the workup of a peripheral nerve injury postpartum. As you know, 1% of our patients end up with some peripheral nerve injury, whether we're involved or not. Most of it's obstetric management, but it certainly is advantageous to document that in this patient population prior to it. Smoking, does this really affect our business substantially? Well, okay, I mean, it has been a public health victory for us, no doubt. Um, there is a disconnect, of course, with our pregnant um, these are rates of, pregnant, of smoking in the non-pregnant and blue and pregnant populations overall. The only disconnect is actually with um, a teenage pregnancy. There's actually an increased risk above the baseline, suggesting some shared risk-taking behaviors. Um, what are the issues for us really in this? Um, I think the, there's a couple out there. Number one, I think be reflective of your own practice, and maybe this is more of your in your in your obstetricians territory. How exactly are you handling smoking cessation in labor? How aggressive are you transitioning people to patches? Um, in the end, it might be that. Um, your effects on carboxyhemoglobin levels may not do much to the mother, but it might really imp improve the um, the buffer in fetuses that are compromised, even with just short abstinence periods. What are the ways that you, um, uh, well, I'll jump into that in one second. Very quickly, um, there's an increased relative risk ratio that's not insignificant. A lot of mor morbidities associated with uh, uh, obstetric outcomes that are increased in this group, even if you think this doesn't impact your management much. It's always intriguing to see the 0.5 risk reduction um, in, uh, with smokers in preeclampsia. Isn't there something we can figure out in this, in this substance that's being delivered um, legally in the United States that could actually reduce this leading cause of morbidity um, and mortality in our patient population? Active area investigation really haven't made much headway there. Um, what it, specifically, what are the details re regarding nicotine replacement therapy? It quickly comes up to the practitioner that these are pregnancy drug categories C and even D. Um, uh, interventions. Um, that being said, you know that there are several hundred 
um, substances in smoking cigarettes, you're replacing this with just nicotine. And that's a huge advantage, uh, particularly in terms of cyanide, um, the cyanide um, administration that's going straight to a fetus. I think you wonder to what degree um, people would smoke if they knew that, that that was a direct result of their um, behavior, delivering that to their uh, newborn, uh, unborn child. Um, Moving along. Oh, this is a topic of controversy. I took this, take a look at this sign I snapped last month uh, giving a talk uh, in Colorado. This was uh, on the lift at Vail going up, and it was a nice tension between federal and state law. Obviously, marijuana is now legal in, in Colorado and several other states, um, but this was uh, the, the lifts at Vail are on federal land. And uh, there it was, right in front of you. Well, 12% of non-pregnant people use uh, cannabis. There's no, there are no great data on this. Uh, I felt um, to to give you in terms of its use continued through pregnancy. Um, it is associated with several negative outcomes. Many of these overlap with tobacco use in itself. A key point in this is that. You've heard about the differences between cannabis potency in the 70s and now. Just look at this tripling in potency in the last 10 to 15 years. That certainly gets our attention. I think maybe the one thing I came across that maybe is worthwhile to passing to you, maybe less so from your obstetric management than perhaps your discussions um, with others in society and the management of your own children. This is, I think, a really nice evidence-based review of the impact of marijuana um, there's a lot of emotion around this, obviously, and a lot of it's uh, related to increased legalization. Um, I think some of the best evidence-based um, information comes out of this review by Volkel in the New England Journal from last year that I, I encourage you to take a look at. Cocaine has really fallen off um, in terms of its prevalence in pregnancy use. It's being replaced by amphetamines and other stimulants. Um, a lot of challenges related to the management of the cocaine intoxicated patient. Um, primarily related to not just hemodynamic management, which I think we're quite good at in, in managing in many circumstances. The prevalence of coronary ischemia in this patient population is quite high and probably warrants a routine uh, evaluation to rule that out with a 12-lead EKG. There's also, and with any drug, but you know, cocaine in particular, a lot of case reports over the creativity of delivery systems and the challenges it creates for us in our business, uh, specifically in this case, is inhalation and thermal injury, managing um, profoundly uh, burned lungs, in, uh, even in pregnant patients, if you can believe that. Um, what, what are the details of the hemodynamics? I'll use data from this uh, animal study by Nancy Oriel, um, now 20 years old, to really demonstrate to what degree you should expect someone who takes a standard dose. Oh, this is animal data extrapolated to humans. Um, to what degree does it impact your hemodynamics? Um, it's a transient bump in your mean arterial pressure with uh, less effect on heart rate, but probably the biggest effect is that there is a probably a 30 to 60 minute substantial impact on uterine blood flow and fetal heart rate, fetal well-being. That does, res that does reflect um, the degree to which the number of patients who abuse this uh, stimulant as well as other stimulants present with abrupted um, abruptions of the placenta, and emergent cesarean delivery for fetal non-reassuring uh, status. This brings up another point. I think you, you can think of substance abuse by the time they get in the hospital, um, well, you start to think to how many hours out from uh, a recent use is this going to affect um, your management. I think it's very naive to think that the majority of people who are using substances, especially in third-term pregnancy, um, aren't continuing to use it under your nose on your labor and delivery ward. Um, I walked into one of my LDRs a month ago um, to see uh, my patient there and a very thick smell of, of marijuana in the room. I mean, come on, I mean, what could be more blatant than smoking uh, marijuana in an LDR? You don't even smoke in a hospital at all. I think a lot of patients um, who are taking substances that are managing uh, coexisting psychiatric illnesses with a high prevalence of anxiety, you are not going to go into one of the most anxiety-provoking experiences of your life without bringing some of your medication that you use. And they're going to use it under your nose. Um, and it's probably going to affect your business. What are the obstetric implications of this? I think the primary ones for cocaine and stimulants that you're seeing to a greater degree now is that they masquerade as uh, preeclampsia both in terms of the hypertension and I understand protein is no longer a criterion for preeclampsia, um, but both cocaine and stimulants end up creating some proteinuria 
um, just as part of that independent of preeclampsia. So I think in managing this, um, I think you have an obligation to rule out coronary ischemia. You probably need to depend to a greater degree on direct acting vasopressors. Um, and I think there was some emphasis yesterday on the management of extremes of hemodynamics at the time of laryngoscopy for a general anesthetic. This is one of those circumstances where there is published evidence to suggest you're really in danger territory with this group specifically and probably should be thinking about using a sodium channel blocker and or a beta blocker to prevent some of those uh, or an opioid perhaps. Um, the question about platelets and, and uh, stimulant use, there are conflicting evidence in two large retrospective series. I I think most people end up checking them anyway because of the confounding um, diagnosis of a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. Um, this is really where the growth in, in stimulants has been. Um, in fact, tw almost a quarter of all pregnancy substance abuse related admissions to hospitals right now are related to um, metamphetamines. This predated the, um, the popularity of the TV show Breaking Bad. Um, this reflects to some degree, this is a little bit older data, 10 years. Red is the use of cocaine and the prevalence of cocaine use in uh, pregnant women. And blue is representing even before a lot of the, stim the uh, methamphetamine craze picked up to what degree it was replacing. That is the preferred stimulant in pregnant women. Um, again, this, this masquerades as preeclampsia or hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. And probably some of the same recommendations apply as to cocaine. Um, again, I want to emphasize the number, the increase risk of cesarean delivery, um, profound effects on neonatal morbidity in methamphetamine and stimulant users, and the likely, increased likelihood of ICU admission in these patients. Um, and of course, always, I think it usually comes up that combative behavior and uh, some of the same considerations with informed consent come um, specifically with the use of um, amphetamines. Again, almost all discussions of substance abuse and the pregnant patient just make a stronger argument for you to use neuraxial anesthesia over its alternatives. Certainly systemic opioids and the unpredictable effects in their combination with other drugs they've had. Um, but yes, you are in a dilemma. You've got a patient that you're a little bit less, you're a little bit more anxious about in terms of consenting them and convincing yourself that they have that there was an appropriate informed process, but they probably m are more likely to need this intervention than a non-substance uh, abusing patient. Um, this is really where a lot of our challenges are, the opioid abusing um, patient. In fact, it's not just abuse. Uh, Brian Bateman published just, um, I think in the last year, a paper that demonstrated that 14% of pregnant women are actually prescribed opioids in pregnancy. There are wide variations in this in terms of um, geography, but it was real eye-opening to our community. And it certainly had some implications in um, a lot of the concerns we've had over time about uh, are they safe to use in pregnancy. Um, I think that is still unanswered. Um, but I think the more important uh, group for us to be concerned about are those who are illicitly using opioids and those who are perhaps flying out of the radar in that they are, have been prescribed opiates but are now using them for something that it wasn't prescribed for. Um, this is Brian Bateman's paper on the prescription trends in, um, in pregnant patients. And most of the drugs uh, that have been prescribed to pregnant patients are hydrocortone and codeine, which you may view as less impactful on some of the decision making you have about uh, subsequent um, opioid dose decisions, for example. Um, but very quickly, um, I think a lot of Questions come up about what's the best way to manage a patient in terms of opioid replacement therapy. Methadone has been the standard for us for years, but it's being mostly replaced by a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. The drug has been called, uh, is trade name as Suboxone. You'll hear a lot of people talking about. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of why this is replacing methadone. A lot of it has to do with less uh, neonatal um, abstinence syndrome development in um, neonates born to these mothers. Um, again, this is a sublingually administered medication. It has a differential combination of drug of, of, um, of opioid um, agonist and antagonist. But I think what most of us don't realize is, and people want to know, then, to, am I, can I reliably administer an opioid following uh, the administration of this drug or someone who is on this drug. In the reality, it probably affects you very little in that regard. First of all, the, the bioavailability of each of these agents is, is even um, 
greater than the four to one combination in the drug, and the duration of their effects is substantially less. I think you're probably going to see far less of this antagonist effect on, on your subsequent um, dosing decisions that you're going to make. Um, probably far more of it's going to be dependent on the fact that they probably have had mu receptors upregulated by chronic administration of this drug. Can't help but throw in a, uh, an icer on you after a morning talk on this. It's cost effective to engage women in this type of uh, counseling and therapy while they're pregnant. Um, what kind of issues do you specifically face in this? You know about an IV drug abuser, uh, well documented, what's the likelihood you'll have difficult IV access? I think in someone who's abusing any drug by IV route, the prevalence of endocarditis and other vegetative lesions is probably high enough that it warrants a probably a quick look with an echo to rule that out. Um, a real trouble for us is that in anybody who is, in fact, most categories of substance abuse that aren't even related to opioids, but certainly in the category of opioids, it's demonstrated that you're going to get less effect of certainly systemic use of those drugs, but neuraxial techniques as well. The problem for us is that there are no well-established guidelines on how to change your dosing. For the most of us, in I've polled audiences over the years and asked what most people do. do most will do exactly what they do in, in a patient that is not on chronic opioids, and then obviously titrate. They have a catheter-based technique that they're titrating to look, uh, in addition to that. So most of us don't change our practice. Um, Opioid withdrawal, the symptoms of it are as a clinical syndrome quite challenging to identify in the pregnant patient. In fact, almost every single one of those symptoms um, looks a lot like labor, doesn't it? Um, in fact, um, what is the likelihood of the timing of withdrawal for any substance? And this specifically is a table of opioids. Almost all of the timeline to uh, withdrawal is going to occur within a realistic time period that someone's going to be in your care. Um, you can certainly envision prolonged inductions of labor, prolonged spontaneous labor, where patients, even on long-acting opioids such as methadone, um, would start to withdraw, and, and a plan needs to be in place for all of these patients. Um, to wrap up this talk, and I know I've whipped through this here to try to get it in 25 minutes, um, there, substance abuse is a really complex social phenomenon. You are not just dealing with an administration of a drug outside of the medical care system, but you're dealing with a high prevalence of coexisting psychiatric illnesses, and you've got some of these other uh, medical considerations um, as well. But I think the psychiatric ones are the ones that are most challenging for us. And what are they specifically? There's a high prevalence of hypomania, anxiety, and depressive disorders associated with um, substance abuse in a pregnant patient, obviously in, in non-pregnant populations as well. But it really takes an additional subset of patients to continue to use medications um, when they understand that there's probably an increased um, pressure for them not to use it. Um, so to conclude, I know I whipped through that quickly, but I think that's kind of how we are on a Sunday morning at the end of a talk. Um, it's prevalent in pregnancy. I want you to be thoughtful in terms of how you manage these specific decisions. There's not a lot of information to help guide your practices. I think the best way you can make decisions is inform yourself by looking at some of this information um, as you go forward and, um, and handle pregnant patients with substance abuse and be vigilant over withdrawal. Thank you. Thank you.